That's all right. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Mace, um, volunteer with the Dharma Collective and so happy you guys are here tonight. The Sangha is really proving to be a respite um, in this very wild and difficult time. And um, it's kind of extraordinary to be de developing community during coronavirus, not just to have developed community and holding it, but developing community. So um, that's really sweet. And I just want to encourage folks. Um, I don't think Katie's here, so I will drop a link in a moment into the chat box um, with the donation information. Um, I'm on the finance committee of the collective and our donations have gone way down, which is totally understandable considering people's finances during the pandemic. Um, but we want to continue to really help support our teachers and we are looking to have a physical space at some point when that's doable so it would be wonderful if people can generously contribute what they can absolutely it's offered freely if that's not possible right now the dharma is more important than that and there's lots of stuff coming up the regular calendar is online there's nothing that I know that's super special, that's you know off the regular schedule, but just you know there's things almost every night of the week happening in the collective. So I'll put the calendar link also in the chat box. Thanks, Thanks Mace. Yeah, I appreciate the sangha too. Building a sangha in these times is a bit it's new for all of us, but here we are, and it's so nice to have a place to come and. Um, find a refuge together and it's an honor to be here with you all i've been gone for about a month and i um, had a fruitful writing retreat continuing to deepen my research uh, particularly on the 21 expressions of tara the protectress or the female buddha it's so popular within buddhism but the 21 aspects are lesser known so i spent a month uh, doing some writing and researching and uh, being quiet, doing a writing retreat. So I appreciate the Eve and Teague, and uh, I think she had some other guests, another guest teacher come. I'm forgetting her name right now. Uh, Venerable but I hope Tenzin. Venerable Tenzin, yes. I have yet to meet Venerable Tenzin, but uh, it felt good to, to um, be able to pull back and have other wonderful teachers pull forward. And I'll teach tonight and also next week, and then Eve will come uh, for the third week of uh of december and then i think it's her and i together before the end of the year i'm pretty sure that's the the rhythm for december so um why don't we go ahead i want to actually before we dive in make a one of my own announcements here i have a upcoming event happening on december 6th i'll chat uh, link in it is a workshop called the wisdom rising it's something i do once a month with another wonderful colleague of mine nina rao she tells stories from the hindu tradition of the goddess and shares chants and kirtan uh, from a beautiful text called the chandipat which is devoted to kali and durga the wrathful feminine and then i'll tell stories and guide meditations and chants to Buddhist divine feminine figures. So we've been doing this for almost a year now, once a month, and it's been a wonderful uh, thing that other people appreciate, so we keep doing it. And everybody's welcome, even if you can't do it. It's uh, 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday, December 6th. You can sign up and get the recording afterwards if you can't make it live. And we also provide a, a bunch of resources, uh, mantras and recordings and other resources for each class that you'll get, whether you're there live or not. So I encourage you guys to, to try that out. It's another aspect of my work that uh, really feeds me. And uh, especially in time of COVID, I can't think of anything better to do than chanting to the divine <laughs> feminine. Or just singing is so helpful and uplifting that's what i have found so that's december 6th and if you have any financial difficulties please don't hesitate to just email me and we can work it out so we're going to start with a, a guided meditation today and then dive into the 21st slogan and have some discussion around it what we'll do for meditation is we will uh, do about a half hour 
40 minute sit of shamatha and then donglen so all the first half or so or maybe a third will be breath awareness to allow us to settle and then i'll guide the donglen practice the compassion practice that is so integral to the lojong or the mind training uh, texts that we've been studying here week by week so please go ahead and make s- yourself comfortable settling into a position that you feel relaxed in that you can hold with relative ease and stillness even if that's the supine position you are completely um, encouraged to listen to your body and do what feels comfortable for you either sitting upright or in the supine position just try to make sure you don't fall asleep (laughs) unless you really need to (laughs) so allowing yourself to close your eyes to begin with and begin to deepen your breath the sense of release and refreshing that we feel when we allow ourselves to turn inward. And land into the moment with the breath in the body. Let each breath nourish you, replenish you. Releasing tension with each out-breath. Noticing if you're holding tension in your face, your jaw, the neck, the shoulders. With each out-breath, feel that tension melting down into the earth beneath you. belly softening with the breath, the low back, the kidneys replenished with each in and out breath. Feel the hips soften, any tension in the legs or the feet relaxed. And let's rest our awareness on our belly for a while within the belly, the navel center, feel the breath expand and release as it fills and empties the body. And feel like the torso is a vase and that the breath is like water filling the vase from the base to the top with each in-breath. And emptying the vase with each out-breath, emptying from the top to the base. Let the mind align with the breath for the next five breaths. Really stay present. Five breaths, just feeling the flow of the breath pouring in and out. Now from this relatively quiet place, pull forth from the heart space your motivation for your practice, your bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening for your own benefit and the benefit of others. Just 
truly a moment of bowing the head to the earth and stating your inner intention to be of service, to find wholeness, to have a meaningful life. Now glide into the breath with even more intimacy, feeling the flow of the temperature, the texture of the breath as it flows in and out of the body. If you wish, bringing the tip of the tongue to rest at the upper palate. And then relaxing the jaw. Notice how that relaxes the heart. The inner space opens as the relaxation unclenches and you find more space, more ease within the inner space of the body and the mind. Continuing that feeling, that grounded anchor of the breath in the belly and releasing tension with the out breath. Knowing that concentration is a key aspect of any meditation practice, really commit to that of gently stabilizing the mind without force, without pressure. It's like a falling in love with the breath. Let the mind come down from its wanderings. Let it come home to the breath in the body. Developing that lovely acuity with the wandering mind of just gently noticing it and bringing it back again and again. A gentle touch, yet a wakeful presence within that relaxation and stability. Releasing any control of the breath, let it just be as it is, whether it's deep or shallow, long or short. This mindfulness of breathing is a total release of any control of the breath. Just observing and unifying the attention, your awareness with the breath in the body.
And now if you wish, gently opening the eyes, let them gaze at a comfortable angle downwards. Just past the level of the nose. Let the gaze be vacant. As if you could see a full 360 degrees around you. You're gazing into the space, the in-between space, which is that space between you and the floor, or the wall, or the cushion. You're gazing into space and softening the eyes. And we turn gently from focusing on the breath to focusing on the mind itself. The mind becomes the object, the domain of the mind. It's called settling the mind in its natural state. Another way of saying shamatha with the mind as the object. Thoughts arise and pass within the space of the mind. Just notice and release any grasping. Release fixation onto thought or feeling, memories. And come back to this quality of space. And wakefulness, like the rays of the sun that pervade space. A simple phrase that you might want to memorize is settle the mind in its natural state, free of grasping, free of distraction. Just rest. This is an undoing, an unraveling of the fixation of the glue that we fix upon thought. Release with the out-breath and allow the mind to settle in its natural state of limpidity, clarity, and stability.
And now we'll shift into the practice of Tongmen, allowing the eyes to close, resting the eyes, yet maintaining that feeling of spaciousness, non-dual experience of outer and inner space. And in the practice of giving and taking the Tonglen, we use the power of our imagination to engage with realities beyond immediate experience. The Tonglen, or the giving and the receiving, aligns with the in and the out breath. With the out-breath, we enact the immeasurable of loving-kindness with the offering of the out-breath. And with the in-breath, we enact the immeasurable of compassion, this taking in the suffering of others is the enactment of that compassionate wish to help relieve suffering. So feel the breath flowing in and out. And bring to mind a loved one or a community of people whom you care about deeply and who is suffering and see them as clearly as you can in your mind's eye. The cause of the suffering may be physical, psychological, social, or environmental, either an individual or a community of people, and see them as clearly as you can. And for a moment, empathetically enter into the suffering of this person or this group. Imagine experiencing the burden of their adversity. It's like putting yourself in their shoes for a moment. And now in your mind's eye, stand back from that and bring forth the wish, may you be relieved of this burden and may this adversity ripen upon me. Whatever the affliction or adversity, the physical and mental, imagine taking from this person the despair, affliction and pain. With the in-breath, as you draw it in, this is the compassion piece. And imagine the suffering in the form of a dark cloud being removed from the other person's body or the group, removed from the body and mind, and being drawn into your heart. And imagine that as the suffering is funneled into your heart, that person is gradually relieved. And as soon as this dark cloud enters your heart, imagine that it meets with your own sense of self-centeredness, visualized as an orb of darkness. And that in an instant, both that cloud of misery and your self-centeredness mutually extinguish each other leaving not a trace of either behind. And then, now imagine that all of your merit, your prosperity, your happiness, all the blessings in your life from the past, present, and future, as a powerful wellspring of brilliant white light emanating from your heart in the reverse direction, Imagine these powerful rays of light reaching out and suffusing the person with the prayer. All that is good in my life, my possessions, my happiness, my good health, my virtues of past, present, and future, I offer to you. 
May you be well and happy. This is the loving kindness with the outbreath. May your greatest yearnings and deepest aspirations be fulfilled. And imagine that the light of virtue and happiness begins to suffuse the people you have brought to mind and imagine their most meaningful desires and aspirations being fulfilled. And yet, as this light from your heart flows forth unimpededly, it is not depleted from its inexhaustible source. Just feeling the textures you breathe in, taking on the suffering, transforming it at your heart, and breathing out all the goodness, and yet not depleting your own heart, your own being. And the next step, is to focus on a person or group who is deluded and acts in ways harmful <clears throat> to themselves and others. So now shifting the visualization and bringing to mind a person or a group of people who might be harmful, confused, deluded. Again, practice taking this burden upon yourself. Imagine their delusion or other mental afflictions such as anger, resentment, and craving, and bring forth the yearning, may you be relieved of the terrible burden of delusion and affliction. And with compassion, breathing in, imagining that the mental afflictions in the form of a dark cloud are drawn from that person or group and taken into your heart where once again it is annihilated, it's purified, it's cleared, transformed, together with your own self-interest, your own delusion, immediately transformed. And as before, now imagine sending forth all of your virtue, your compassion, wisdom, your generosity, in the form of a radiant, purifying, clear light, suffusing this individual or group with the aspiration. All that is good in my life I offer to you. May your most meaningful aspirations be fulfilled. And vividly imagine this to be so. And feeling that infinite resource at the heart center, that transformed, awakened mind of luminosity, like the rays of the sun ever shining. And now expand the practice of Tonglen <coughs> to take in all suffering and mental afflictions and send forth all your virtue and goodness. Let your mind rove throughout your environment and throughout the world, alighting upon an individual, a community, or a nation, one after another. And during each inhalation, imagine taking in the burden of suffering and the sources of suffering with the in-breath. And with each exhalation, imagine rays of light emerging from your heart a light of healing, grace, blessing that illuminates wherever you attend to.
Draw your awareness into your own body and imagine the radiant light of virtue and joy emanating from your heart and suffusing your whole body. And imagine your body so full of light that the light cannot be contained and rays are emitted from every pore of your body in all directions. Now complete the practice of Tonglen with a dedication of merit. I'll offer a short prayer, but you feel free to make your own. By the merit of this practice, may every sentient being gain liberation from suffering and the sources of suffering. May the deepest yearning of each be fulfilled. And that completes our practice of Tonglen. We'll slowly come back to our virtual room. And breathe into your body, maybe move a little bit, take care of your biology if you need to, get a drink of water, or stretch out, take a moment. And then any questions or comments are always welcome after practice. You can chat or I don't know if you can unmute yourself. I, I can't remember what we do here, but either way is fine with me. This was a different Tonglen than we usually do. I uh, adapted it from uh, one of my favorite books on the Lojong by Alan Wallace. So you may have noticed it was different. It might have felt different. Uh, there are so many different ways we can do Tonglen. And this one is very much based on a, one of the traditional ways. Um, some are more elaborate. Some are more straightforward. The, one, the, the thing that makes this one different than the ones I usually guide are is that we actually imagine that the suffering that we have in our heart also transforms as the suffering that we're breathing in strikes it so that there's this moment of combustion <laughs> and obliteration even we could say and then it's like from that the luminosity of the heart center the heart chakra this orb of light that we always resource yet in the tonglen appears and that's a common analogy of the nature of our own mind. Our Buddha nature is in there. It's shining, but it's just clouded and uh, temporarily obscured by our karmic propensities, by our delusion, our confusion, our ways of thinking and being. And so I thought that imagery was very interesting. Okay, I see a, a question coming in. Why do we open our eyes for meditation before Tonglen? You don't always have to, but the 
The phase of the shamatha that we've been doing primarily here is called settling the mind in its natural state. And that is done with the eyes open. So I got you started with the breath awareness, what we can do with the eyes closed or open. But then when we shift into settling the mind in its natural state, where we're taking the mind as the object instead of the breath, which was the object before that, it's helpful to open the eyes because we're working with this that in-between space. And it helps us to dissolve this illusion of inner and outer, or that we can only meditate when we have our eyes closed. I mean, the, the teachings say that we integrate meditative awareness into every aspect of our daily life. So it's good to start working with the eyes open. And the, the sutras do say, the early sutras based on the Buddha's teachings say to rest the gaze past the level of the nose. So op opening the eyes slightly is actually very viable and very old way of meditating. Okay, Jason says, the inner orb of self-centeredness was a powerful image. It helped me to visualize it and dissolve it with the in-breath. Good, interesting. Thank you. Diane says, thank you for this practice. What is the name of the book by Alan Wallace that you referred to, his book on Lojong? Yeah, this is a book here. It's called Buddhism with an Attitude. Buddhism with an Attitude. And he calls it this, it's kind of a funny title, isn't it? Um, but he calls it that because the attitude that he's referring to is bodhicitta. It's got tood. <laughs> it's the bodhicitta tood. Meaning we practice with attitude. We practice with an intention, with a mood, with an intent to awaken for the benefit of all. It's bodhicitta, which is the whole point of Tonglen and Lojong, mind training. So, um, Claudia says, when settling the mind in its natural state, is it okay to observe the thoughts and follow them, or are we always supposed to let them go, not to grasp? Yes, always letting go, not grasping, because we don't want to get caught in the story or follow them. We're training. That's the natural propensity of the mind, the habitual state of the mind, is to follow thoughts. We're really good at that. And so the practice is actually to settle the mind in its natural state, not its habitual state. And the natural state is that clear, limpid, still, open, expansive, luminous nature of mind. So that's what we're trying to s drop into, release into. And so it's interesting. Do you notice that when thoughts form, it's like there's a constriction, there's a little bit of a, a tightness, a forming. It's, it's not good or bad. Thoughts aren't inherently good or bad, but it's it's actually, you've become fascinated with that as the thought comes and it's gripping a bit. There's a tightening, a focus of energy. And then often it just takes us and then we've been lost for a while. But with this settling the mind in its natural state, like other forms of mindfulness practice too, you're practicing of like, oh, watching that formation happening. You can slow it down with your attention. You can watch it come into formation. And then if you can release, like with the out-breath, it's very nice, but you don't always have to just do it with the out-breath. You let go and you let, you soften, you let go of the clinging. The thought just dissolves back into the space from which it emerged. And you don't disappear. It's not like... You know, what you learn in meditation is that you're not your thoughts. This metacognitive capacity to be aware of your thoughts and to be aware of, of, of awareness is quite phenomenal. And that's what we're doing here in this practice in particular. So that's why we're taking the mind as the object, meaning the domain of the mind. The arena within which thoughts come and go. Okay, so we did two aspects of shamatha. We did breath awareness at the beginning to stabilize, and then we did uh, settling the mind in its natural state, which is shamatha with the mind as the object. Then we closed the eyes, and I guided you through a tonglen visualization practice. And the tonglen is often done with the eyes closed. Um, it's pretty standard because we're really using the creative faculty of the imagination it's easier to, you know, 
imagine people and the world and groups of beings, countries, and so on, with the eyes closed. Okay, so the next slogan here is very beautiful. It's within the fifth point. You know, what we're doing is we're studying the Chekawa Yeshe Dorje's text on the seven-point mind training. So we have, it's like we have seven chapters. That's, we can think of the points as chapters. And within each of those chapters, we have numerous slogans. What's interesting is in this fifth point that we're in now, that started a couple weeks ago with slogan 19, all dharmas agree on one point. You might remember that one. There are only four slogans in this fifth point. I think we make available this PDF that I made years ago. It's all the slogans. It's listed one after the other. should be on the website. should be in the resources on our uh, Well of Being page at the SF Dharma Collective. If not, you can let us know. But... Um, Today we're doing the 21st slogan, and I just wanted to call off the prior few because this fifth point is very interesting. The title of this chapter, of the fifth chapter of the Lojong slogans, is Measures of Proficiency in Mind Training, or Evaluation of Mind Training is another way to translate it. So these, fi these four slogans in point five are all about checking in. How are you doing? How is your mind training doing? So with the 19th slogan, it was all dharmas agree at one point. In a nutshell, what that means is all of these practices that we do, all of the dharmas, meaning teachings or practices, are aimed at one thing, which is developing bodhicitta, both on the relative level and on the absolute level, right? Relative level bodhicitta is compassion. Ultimate level bodhicitta is the realization of emptiness. Vipassana, insight, which is your true nature, which is your Buddha nature. So that's the 19. 20, which is what Teague and Eve taught on last week so beautifully, of the two witnesses hold the principal one. Two witnesses are self and others. And the principal one here is the one it's saying to hold to, which is the self, not in a selfish way, but in a way of trusting yourself, trusting your instinct, being honest with yourself and others, doing what is, feels right for you, you know, and really knowing that and trusting it. I thought the teaching last week was beautiful. If you didn't attend uh, the class, I recommend watching it on our YouTube channel. And then today we dive into the 21st slogan, always maintain a joyful mind. <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> always maintain a joyful mind. Hmm. Another way to sing it is always maintain a joyful attitude or cheerful attitude. So on the surface, it seems simplistic to say that. I mean, it sounds like what my mom used to say, you know, cheer up, lighten up. And, and that was like the worst thing she could say to me. It would make me even more angry, <laughs> you know. And so it seems simplistic to suggest that you should just always be joyful. Of course, there's so much suffering in the world, and there's nothing worse than being told to cheer up when you're having a hard time. So that's not what this slogan is about. It's not about pretending to be happy when you're not or forcing yourself to think or feel a certain way. That's not what this is about. It is a gentle prod or nudge to remind you to, lo to, to open your perspective, to have a bigger perspective on things. And this doesn't mean that you don't care about suffering or feel the pain of others feel, uh, or the problems of the world, or even your own suffering. It just means that you can loosen your grip and keep your sense of humor even when things aren't going well. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? So how do we do it? So 
If our good cheer, if our happy disposition, if our joy is dependent upon pleasant circumstances, it will constantly be interrupted, right? We know that. I think a lot of us are here. We're brought to the Dharma because of our recognition that the satisfaction and the fulfillment we long for just can't come from external circumstances, people, stimuli, substances. And so we're looking for something deeper. We can choose our priorities, right? So what do we want more than anything else in our life? Is it possessions, praise, reputation, good health? Or from a Dharma perspective, if more than anything, what we want, what we aspire to, what we desire is to awaken, to have a compassionate heart and a mind of wisdom. If that is our highest priority, then that is the cultivation of the two bodhicittas that I spoke of earlier, this compassion on relative level and awakening, insight, wisdom on the ultimate level. These are the two bodhicittas. If those are our deepest desire, our main goal, what we really want in the world, then this focus is the key that makes it possible to cultivate and accomplish a constant sense of good cheer in the midst of all the vicissitudes of life. So, in other words, when bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening, right? Bodhi means awakening. Chitta means heart-mind. So it's the mind, the heart, the heart-mind of awakening, the intent, the aspiration to awaken for the benefit of all beings, not just yourself. So if that is our highest priority as Dharma practitioners, then any circumstances can be an opportunity for insight and compassion. For example, if we're with a disagreeable person, we can appreciate the circumstances that gave rise to this person's behavior. Perhaps through that understanding, We can transform judgmental thoughts. And as a real authentic Lojong practitioner, notice when we're judging, notice when we're averse, and turn it and see this as an opportunity to practice and maybe make an aspiration for this person, like may this person be free of their delusion, (laughs) may they be free of their suffering, may they have the circumstances to find happiness. So rather than being caught in duality and being like, that guy's such a jerk, think about, wow, they must really have suffered to become such a jerk. (laughs) May they be free of that suffering. May they find happiness. And when our heart softens, the harsh judgments start to soften. They evaporate. And I want to make another point here because this is very important and I think especially right now with the winter coming and COVID and so much going on that we can feel varying degrees of sadness, right? So sadness is said to be the near enemy of compassion. So we can look at it actually as a transitional state or a precursor to genuine compassion. So we have to be aware not to get stuck in it because we s- it's actually a bridge to authentic compassion. So notice that when, when sadness arises, maybe instead you could imagine, how can I be of benefit? So like if we're sad because of the news, because the suffering out there or of a loved one or even like of our own situation how can I be a benefit how can the sadness be transformed into something else so that I can be a benefit how can I help and then try to come back to a sense of as Alan Wallace calls it good cheer find the lightness 
find some humor. I don't know about you, but I'm I'm always seeking out humor right now. <laughs> I'm just checking out SNL clips on YouTube. <laughs> I am listening to Trevor Noah podcasts on my walks. I want to laugh. I want to laugh as much as possible, right? So whatever you do to get happy, do it. Seek out the good cheer, especially right now. So mundane concerns are little things, but they can seem enormous. And when our mind is fixated or small, wrapped around the mundane concerns, the analogy is like that of a balloon. Sometimes the mind, like a balloon, shrivels, and then sometimes it expands, depending on the volume, depending on your perspective. So as much as we can, keep that big mind in balance, that perspective, at least practice up and expanding it out and not getting collapsed in upon ourselves. Of course, there are colossal issues that feel heavy and are heavy. And in the midst of being aware, of course, that millions of people are suffering from poverty, illness, trying to maintain a sense of upliftment, of being a benefit, so that our capacity is more activated and not succumbing to compassion's near enemy of sadness, not succumbing to a sense of futility and apathy. That is what this slogan is talking about. And I want to read a story to you from another fave Lo Jong book called The Intelligent Heart. The Intelligent Heart by Zigar Kongtro. Zigar Kongtro. Um, page 112. The story tells you and ex- gives you an example of what this can be like. Zigar Kongtro writes, Back in the 80s, I heard a story about a man in New York who was terminally ill. He was angry and depressed, especially because he couldn't do the things he wanted to do. When people tried to do things for him, he would get even more irritated. This is common in people with serious illnesses. And his state of mind was getting worse and worse. And when his family visited, he would become abusive. And they didn't know what to do. So one day his friend asked a Tibetan monk to come over and give him Tonglen instructions. That was a good idea. (laughs) The man was very very angry at his friend for inviting this bald, maroon-robed man into his room. The monk gave him some simple instructions and then left. Over the next few months, the man, the dying man, changed. He became more peaceful and friendly and started expressing gratitude to people. Near the end, he actually felt grateful for his illness. His family was relieved, but they didn't understand what had happened. Finally, his friend asked him what had changed. And the man said that for weeks he had been angry about the monk. But after a long period of being stuck in his apartment 24 hours a day with his miserable mind, he realized that blaming others and feeling angry wasn't getting him anywhere. He decided to try the monk's suggestion of exchanging self and other, Donglen, and he found it helpful. The more he practiced Donglen, the more helpful it was. It brought him relief from his pain, anxiety, and reactions. He saw that his pain was not so much from his illness as from his own mind, and that he could address that pain by getting rid of his deep attachments to himself. Then he started thinking about the kindness of others and realized how much of that he had received without acknowledging it. 
As he began to show appreciation to others, it made him happier and happier until he felt that he owed his transformation to his illness, which had been so painful to him. He realized that without the illness, he never would have changed. And when he finally died, he was at peace. real stories. This happens. It's like, you know, if we have to get sick of ourselves. We have to get tired of our habits, of our thinking. That's why retreat can be really good because it strips away all the distractions and it kind of speeds that process that this man went through. It kind of speeds it up. And then we have to look at it and work with it and realize that we have to breathe it in. We have to let it come home and stop exiling it. There's really no other path. I think it was Rilke, or maybe it was Jung. I can't remember now, but one of those wise men said, there's only one journey, the inner journey. And that this this wonderful story shows that. I'd love to hear from you now. Hear your questions, your thoughts. Maybe you have experiences like this. You can share as a community here in our virtual land. I have other things I can say, but of course, it's always fun to hear from you, too. And if if you don't want to talk, you don't have to. I find you you much more shy on the the Zoom, which makes sense. It's not like being in a room together. (laughs) But please don't be shy. Hi, Carlos. That was a really powerful practice. Um, That really resonates with what you said about um, and we have compassion and sadness too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's good medicine right now because it can be easy to get kind of caved in on ourselves. I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking about myself. <laughs> It's it's uh, more now than ever this time of year. You know, after a long year of COVID, we're we're turning towards the darkness, and uh, it feels good to welcome in that, but also welcome in some teaching from a culture. You know, this came, the roots of this came from India into Tibet, and then the Tibetans really crafted the lojong, and. Th- Tibet was not an easy place to live. Um, And yet they really were able to benefit from this way of thinking, this, this turning the tables on the ego. It's actually, my happiness is not going to come by fixating on me and what I want. And this, that's why I love, that's why I can come back to the Tonglen and the Lojong again and again and again. This is my, I think I've said this before, this is my desert island practice. If I had to just take one thing to a desert island, it would be the Lojong. It's so rich and wise and practical. Anyone else? Yeah, Claudia. Hi. <coughs> and then Leanne after you. No, I was just thinking that in that practice and the story that you just said, uh, I guess we're thinking we're we're helping others, that we're actually helping others, but really <laughs> we're also helping ourselves, isn't it? I mean, it's just yes. so reciprocal and gratifying. Uh, it makes us, makes us feel good. So it's good, good medicine. Indeed. 
Yeah, yeah, whether or not it really helps others, we don't know. The verdict is still out, right? It might. And I think it does. But we have to, it's like Arjuna in the Mahabharata legend, you have to let go of that arrow when you when you release it from the quiver. You, ha- you We can't control what happens next, right? So hopefully those prayers go out, a light goes out, and helps beings. But really what we've got is what we're left with, which is us. And it is medicinal for us. And we know that, that at least that is palpable and true. In fact, it's really good to do this practice really consciously letting go of any investment and fixing other people because that's still a little clouded with clinging, right? So it's a good point that you make, Claudia. It's a refinement that usually people discover on their own, like, oh, actually, I can't really control that other person. (laughs) So I'm just going to send those prayers out. And, and attend to what I can attend to, what's right here. Okay, Leanne? Um, hi. Yeah, thank you. I've uh, been in really spiraling victim mode lately in my mind. I'm just having really negative thoughts. Um, I'm really crippling insomnia, which is enough to turn you suicidal. And so... Um, and and I like have caught myself that I'm like being a brat, like a real brat in my mind, um, but haven't known how to turn it around. And uh, I haven't, I, I've sat retreats, but I really have let go of my practice for a few years. And so this is like tonight, the first, my like clawing my way back to, to something. <laughs> and um, it was really powerful to sit and helpful. And it's like, all right, <laughs> there's, there's a whole drift and there's a, there's a whole lot out there that can, um, I mean, it's like, it feels so simple, but it's one thing to kind of berate yourself for being an asshole in your head and then to actually have a practice to help like start to somatically reverse course is, um, uh, give some hope. Yes. Thank you. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad you're here. And the the best thing about habits is they're learned behavior and they can be unlearned. So our negative thinking, all that, that's learned behavior. That's not really who we are. And so with these types of practices, we can retrain the mind and, and retrain that, those neuronal pathways to move more towards you know, happiness, joy, contentment, compassion. And I know I, it's really hard not to, it's, it's, a, it's a real common thing to berate ourselves when we, we know we're not thriving or we're not doing things perfectly or we have chronic pain or insomnia, these types of things. I, I'm working with chronic pain. It's been, I bow down every day. And without the practices, it would be really, really bad. And... Um, yeah, don't give up the hope. You keep coming back. And keep, even when you're lying in bed, not being able to sleep, you can practice Tonglen now. You know you have something to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then not identifying with it is a really big, important reminder because you start to feel pretty bad about yourself when your thoughts aren't. Yes. Yes, it's their clouds coming and going. It's not who you are. Thank you. Anyone else? Chandra, I have a question. It's Mace. Yeah. Um, I've never heard that the near enemy to compassion is sadness. I've only ever heard it as pity which is a very different emotion for me. And so yeah. I had a little reaction when you said that, because I, you know, like as a mental health practitioner, obviously being stuck in sadness is not ideal, but moving through sadness and allowing sadness to be is, I just feel like so many of us grow up being told not to be sad or to like not cry. And so yeah, 
I'm curious about that interpretation I, of the near enemy being sadness. I, you know, honestly, it could be a couple of different things. It could be a translator's choice. And I can look at the Tibetan to see. Um, because in a way, the way Alan might be using sadness is like feeling sad for the world, you know, like pity. Um, or it could be a little difference between traditions, right? different interpretations, which can happen sometimes. So I also noticed that. And my sense was it was a uh, translator's choice. And it does have a different flavor. And I love how Alan talks about it. And uh, this is Alan Wallace in the book, uh, Buddhism with an Attitude. He talks about it as a bridge, as, as it's, it's an opening to authentic compassion. Let sadness be, a, what's next? How can I be a benefit? And I guess pity could also serve as the same thing, right, Mace? Okay, so here's pity up, oh, but don't get stuck in pity. What, what comes out of that? How can I enact compassion? How can I be of service? I just I would like to chime in too, Chandra and Mace about sadness, um, because I've been feeling a lot of sadness as a both as a response to the COVID. Just it's kind of like whenever I feel overwhelmed, the place I go is sadness, <clears throat> and and that's part of how I am. But I was also told as a young person, don't I? My mom used to say, I don't want you to be sad. You know, and it's kind of like I got the message it wasn't okay to be sad. And especially as a man and as somebody who's like, you know, trying to cope and sadness has this aura and it, it's a real kind of difficult, it's very simple feeling, but it's very difficult to, to allow it. And uh, I really, today I had kind of a breakthrough and I was told about a practice that I wanted to share, which is like to put your hand next to your heart and then to put your other hand on your arm and just kind of soothe mm -hmm. and man it just brought me right to sadness and, and it was but it was the bridge mm -hmm. it was like i felt like by doing that i could just kind of, it's okay to be sad and it made me feel comfort in the sadness and then i was able to kind of let go and it really uh, just the body made made it possible to not get into my head about it i just wanted to share that super powerful that's beautiful. What a nice, simple practice. And we all have, well, you know, if we have two arms, then we have that capacity. Yeah. It feels really good. And it immediate, my immediate, like the immediate impact of that was like, oh, I'm sad. I'm, yeah. It was allowing to feel that. Yes. And it, it's not as scary. Sometimes I'm scared of it, you know, but that was more, com it was much more comforting to do that than just sort of try to try to contain it. <clears throat> yeah. absolutely absolutely the sadness is a bridge and it's it's its own thing also and it's important to let it have the space to be there and to let let ourselves cry and to feel that things move when we can cry when we, if we try to hold it back we just spend years of suffering it, it's clenching around it and just let the cry happen you know if you have to go sit on the toilet and close the door and cry do that <laughs> sometimes I do that with my kids like I just go and go in the shower and cry or you know like just we find your place to just let it out and then it go then it's then you can keep breathing and then and then like you said Jason then feel what's next you know what's beneath that what's after that Chandra, I have a question. Um, yeah. You know, when we were doing the uh, the meditation of letting the, the mind settle in its natural state, I was asking you about the thoughts because I was, all of a sudden I had this image of myself kind of like expanding my arms and being like a little child, you know, with the sunshine and just feeling like really free. Mm. But then all of a sudden I had this fear, this negative 
feeling, you know, fear. And then I said to myself, come on, no, trust, trust, let go. And, lo and so I guess my question is like, what do you do with the negative thoughts? Because I thought we're not supposed to fight them, but to go through them and feel them. And that's why I was asking you if we're supposed to observe them and kind of, I mean, yeah, not get involved in the story, but just observe the thoughts, or is that a totally different practice? Okay, I must have misunderstood the question. Yes, you can observe them, but don't try not to go with them somewhere else, right? Mm. Don't, don't. You can observe them, but if you start noticing that you're getting um, wrapped up in, in a story around it, of the, oh, I'm afraid now. Why am I afraid? Oh, because maybe my, I, my parents didn't let me go off on my own enough. Or, you know, like if that starts happening, let that go, dissolve. You know, that, that's, that's the habitual state of the mind to think. And so that's what this practice is about, is training up and like recognizing that. And then, and you can watch the display of its arc, right? So it looks like you had this really nice observation moment where you observe the arc of the expansion and the contraction and then the release. Like, you, yeah, that's the, like the witness. You're witnessing that. And that's definitely what's happening and what, what, I don't want to say should, but if I were, I would say should be happening. You know, that is okay. That is, that naturally happens. And it's true that the point, especially of this style of settling the mind in its natural state is to not fix anything. We were not looking for bliss. We're not looking for clarity. We're not looking for, uh, we're not hating on thoughts or, we're actually opening up the domain, the awareness to rest and be aware of the domain of the mind and all the circus shows that arise and pass within that domain of the mind without reaction, without grasping, without clinging. So in some sits it might be pleasurable, in some sits it might be painful, you might have all of it all in one sit. And the Dzogchen, you know, like the, the this great perfection, Nyingma practice of settling the mind in its natural state is about developing that witness, that capacity to be with the fatigue. If you're tired, you're tired. I, I remember sitting on long retreats and battling with fatigue until finally I heard the teacher say, if you're tired, don't react to it. Just observe it. And it was so liberating. It was like the fatigue wasn't a problem anymore. So it's that type of feeling. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems like you're coming more Thank to you. a sense of ease with it, more familiarity and comfort with this practice that was quite different than what you were used to doing, right, Claudia? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Make it your own. <laughs> Thank you. I still can't keep my eyes open, though, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come. You Maybe you need to do it during the morning after a nice tea or coffee and s gaze at the really sweet, tender blue sky, like before it's fully illuminated by a bright sun. <clears throat> That's the best time, like when the sky is changing and it's going from pink to blue. Then you could just sit by a window or out on a deck, wherever you can go to a park, wherever you can go. And just, for me, I mean, that's really the way these practices were developed, were in nature. And, and sky gazing is a very big part of this practice, or a a different aspects of this practice. And I find that, that it's a much more easeful, natural, j pleasant, accessible when I'm out in nature doing these practices. So as much as you can get out, please do. I see Juliet is in nature right now <laughs> in her beautiful field of flowers. <laughs> it's great. Okay, Jenny wrote something here. Thank you so much. It makes me think how much healing those around the dying man felt in their own beings as the man found his peace. Yes, yes. Well put.
put. Thank you, Jenny. So I want to just leave with some ad some input. Uh, this practice is indispensable. So not just on the cushion, but in the car, in the restaurant, at your work, in the airplane, wherever you are. See if you can do the Tonglen. Even if you see somebody who seems like a homeless person or somebody who's in a a bad state in front of you at the grocery store or wherever. Instead of the normal reaction, start doing the tonglen. Breathe out the compassion, the offering. I'm sorry, breathe out the loving kindness of offering light and clarity and freedom. And then breathe in with that's the compassionate act of receiving by breathing in any suffering that that person might have. Transform it at your heart. And while you're at it, transform your own suffering. I thought that was really cool about this technique that I'd never seen before. And then breathe out the clarity and transform with the in-breath and out. As you're falling asleep, do your own tonglen for your own self. Whether it's, you know, the abandoned child or the exiled you know, teenager, whatever we all carry within our parts, right? Our parts of ourselves. You can practice Tonglen for your parts. <laughs> um, yeah, so Deborah's asking, is there a place we can find that story to read it? Yes, Deborah, it's in The Intelligent Heart. The Intelligent Heart. And um, I'll write his name because it's not easy to spell. Zigar, pretty cool name. Zigar Kong Trul. There, it's in the chat. Oh, I just did that to Mace only. So the advice is to weave it into your day and to start your day. See if you can start your day with some Tonglen, or at least remembering this teaching of bringing joy and committing to transform all joys and sorrows onto the path of awakening, which is the main thrust of Lojong. That everything is fertilizer for your beautiful garden of wholeness and awakening. Whether it's adversity or bliss or joy, transform all of that onto the path of enlightenment. So if you start your day like that, can you maintain it? How long can you maintain that? That view, holding the view. Holding the Lojong view. Everything is a teacher, right? Remember the slogan, be grateful to everyone? This is connected with that. Because that's how we've, we have this sense of good cheer, is when we see everything as a teacher. Even our enemies... In the Lojong teachings, they say that the enemies are even more important than the Buddhas because they really teach us. They teach us patience. They teach us compassion. This is the brilliance of the Lojong. It turns it all on its head and challenges us to see the world differently. And notice what circumstances in your day, in your life, impede your well-being and respond to them with this practice. Respond to them with dharma. And then don't beat yourself up if you forgot. <laughs> Just take it easy. Humor. Laughter. Do you laugh enough in your life? If you don't, start. Find ways. Make a little silly joke. Laugh louder than you normally do. <laughs> Send a goofy text to a friend. I've been sharing little funny memes. Just those kind of acts of sharing the joy and laughing together is so important. 
And we can cry together too. <laughs> yeah. That's all I've got. Like they like Dujum Lingba said, I've emptied out my beggar's bag, shown you everything I've got. If it's useful, great. If not, you know, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everybody. Lots of love. Thanks, Mace, for hosting. Thank you, SF Dharma Collective, for your wonderful work and keeping this Sangha thriving. And please, whatever you can donate, please donate to the community so that we can keep keep on keeping on. And uh, you're always welcome. So I'll see you back here next Wednesday. We have other weekly classes that are really great with Michael Taft. Uh, Michael Owens, uh, other teachers. Uh, so watch the website and s stay in touch. Mace, do you want to say anything before we go? I just dropped the uh, link into the chat box again for donations. Um, it is super helpful when you donate if you put the name of the teacher who's teaching. Um, it's helpful. Um, and it's just so delighted people are here. And also just to let folks know if you want to sit in the morning just in community without any guidance or talk, just pure silence, we have a sit every morning at 7. That's very sweet. That's it. Just so happy everyone's here. And check out the YouTube channel because the, all the, uh, everything on Wednesday goes up on our YouTube channel. So some good stuff if you need to hear stuff again or you missed a class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can unmute yourself. Say good goodbye night. if you want. Bye. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Mace. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take Bye. care. Take care. Bye, Karen. Good to see everybody. Good Thanks, night, Chandra. Thank you.